Hello and welcome to Fuse from PRCA, the podcast for professional marketers, communicators and people working in public relations. Today's episode is truly fascinating and in some ways it's a follow-up episode with David Gallagher. I am incredibly excited about this episode. Farzana, it's lovely to be with you again on this one. David is someone who I always enjoy speaking to, but you and David have been uh, colleagues and, you know, connected for an incredibly long time. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have David. I have been inspired by David's work and uh, and just his incredible ability to convene and build relational capital with the industry. Everyone who I meet always uh, speaks so highly of you, David. Um, so David has obviously been at the forefront of the PR industry for decades. He is a global PR strategist and a business leader. Um, he has a history of helping organizations and brands thrive through purpose, resilience and impact. 25 years and, and more at Ketchum, Omnicom and the head of British and Global Trade Groups, author, speaker and dual US-UK national. Uh, he's now the managing partner of the Next Practices Group, a new and rapidly growing agency investment group looking to unlock what's next in marketing and communications worldwide. David, we are so thrilled to have you with us today. Welcome. Well, I'm really happy to be here with, with both of you. I, I I think I posted on social media. I was really excited to see you guys partnering on this on this podcast, a, a production that I was happy to join a few years ago with with you, Dan. Um, and I couldn't think of a, of a way to improve it, but you did by bringing uh, Farzana on. So it's uh, it's 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 great to be here with you, and looking forward to the conversation. Brilliant, thank you. So, so David, I have I have read your book, um, which I you're actually, in my book. Yes, yes, I'm in your book as well, and it was such an eye opener because actually reading about the book about placing purpose at, at the heart of uh, of communications, um, and it was just you know I think one of the best books I've read in PR. Um, and I've also been really fortunate to work alongside you. You've been incredible, just your strategic thinking, your experience, your kindness. Um, so I feel very, very privileged. And what I'd love to do is to just share your journey and your insights with our listeners. Um, so, you know, your, your journey started off with journalism uh, in the 1990s. And I'd love to, you know, for you to just share you know, the different phases of your career uh, so that, you know, everyone can contextualize um, the conversation that we're going to have with you today. I had a little bit of a dress rehearsal for this. I spoke to a university uh, course in Germany, uh, a mix of British, American, German, I guess, other students from, from Europe. And they kind of asked me this, the same question. So I, I, I kind of know where they were paying attention and maybe where they where they checked out. But uh, you're right. I started as a, I, I thought I was going to be a journalist. I studied journalism at the University of Texas uh, in Austin, where I, where I grew up, uh, near where I grew up. And, and that's kind of the journey that I thought I was going to uh, to, to begin. And th there wasn't really a, a road to Damascus conversion. I started off as a, as a science and policy writer, but I gradually started taking on other responsibilities. I'll get to that in a moment that they brought me closer into what we would all consider to be classic PR. And then at some point I realized I was a PR person and, and not a, uh, not, not a journalist, but um, you know, it's tempting when you, when you try to summarize your, your career, especially when you've just been, you know, you're as old as I am, you have as many years behind it as, as I do. It's, it's kind of tempting to look back and then, and then structure uh, a narrative, some sort of journey um, that, that makes some, some sense. And um and I think that's kind of what I did when I spoke to university class. But when I when I saw the record, heard the recording, I realized that was a little bit misleading in a way. You know, you tend to kind of cast yourself as a hero in some sort of you know Luke Skywalker type journey of of, of redemption, and that's just not how my career, at least, has played out uh, at, at at all. If anything, I think my career is more like a, has been more like a, a Forrest Gump <laughs> story of being at the right place uh, at, at the right time and, and maybe making myself available to, to, to you know opportunities as they presented themselves. So just in, in kind of short form, chapter one for me was set in Texas. I, I grew up there, uh, went to university there. That definitely was the, the source of my values, such as they are, probably my biases prejudices um, and my outlook at the world was of the world was was definitely formed uh, in a small town in, in Texas um, chapter two for me after university was in 
in Washington, D.C. Um, I Texas was in a pretty significant recession when I left university. It's hard to imagine that now as as as, as hot as the economy is there. But uh, I got on my first airplane ever. I'd never been on an airplane until I moved to Washington, D.C. with a one-way ticket, no job, uh, and, and um, just thought I'd see what happened next. And uh, as it happens, I, I did find work with, with a small nonprofit that converted into work with a bigger nonprofit. But again, I was a science and, and policy writer. Um, and it wasn't until I came in contact with an agency called Hill and Milton that I saw um, what, what PR was like. I thought I kind of wanted to do something like that. But um, uh, from uh, the American Diabetes Association, that this larger not-for-profit, I found my way into Ketchum. Uh, at, th at that time, a medium-sized PR company. It, it subsequently grew into becoming one of the biggest PR companies uh, in the world. And I was doing just kind of classic healthcare-related uh, PR. Um, chapter three for me was in London. Um, my CEO at the time said, hey, you know, I don't know what's next for you, but would you consider doing a stint in, in London? So again, I got on an airplane. I had been on plenty of airplanes by that point, but I didn't have a passport. I had to get a, a passport. <laughs> Uh, it was really arrogant of me to think that I could just drop into a foreign country and, and help run an agency or build a, a practice. And it was pretty humbling. And then um, uh, it was very humbling, but that worked its its way out. And then the last chapter, the one I'm in now, still set in, in London, uh, but outside of, out of Ketchum, outside of the holding company, that Omnicom that Ketchum owns, and, and on to something that I think is hopefully going to be just as exciting as, as the first uh, first three chapters. And I just take you through that to say that you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, I never knew what was going to happen next. Um, and for anybody who's sitting there wondering, can they do something different? Can they climb out of whatever thing they're in now and find something new and, and interesting? Do they have the skills for that? You definitely do. You just have to uh, kind of make yourself available to, to those those opportunities. And that was my main message for the students, that you don't know what's next. But if you have a good attitude and an open mind, opportunity will generally find you. Um, I just encourage them to get out and, and see what they could do. I mean, you spent uh, so twenty six years at Omnicom. Who's counting? But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you know, and obviously you you know you made the decision to leave and you know and have a look over the other side of the wall uh, because obviously you were very much sort of involved in you know sort of big agency land. Um, and you know, did you find it quite sort of um, quite scary the prospect of leaving? You know, almost institutionalized, you know, 26 years is a very, very long time. And I'm sure this, some of our listeners are sort of thinking, you know what, I'm in an organization or a job, I've been there for a certain amount of time, I'd quite like to see, um, you know, and, and explore other pastures. But you know, people tend to be quite sort of nervous about change, especially sort of as we as we sort of um, grow into our careers. So just wanted to know just a little bit more about your sort of decision making process and, you know, um, and, and how that journey has been for you, that, that sort of pivot that you've done. Yeah, well, yeah, no, actually, I was terrified, uh, to be honest. And, and, and that terror probably delayed a decision by at least a year, maybe maybe two years. You know, like a lot of people, the pandemic kind of uh, accelerated some thought processes I was having. Um, I knew that I didn't want to get to a point where I was burned out or or angry or disliking my job. I think sometimes people do that. Um, I, so I didn't want to be in a place where I was running from something. I definitely wanted to be headed toward uh, something. I wasn't entirely sure what that 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 was. Um, you know, I was nervous that my skills wouldn't translate in the outside uh, world. Um, a place like Ketchum, and then when I went to the to the holding company, you know, it's a self-contained universe, um, and you start to believe that your value is really navigating that little self-contained universe, and you kind of lose track of what's happening out outside. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a frightening process. Um, I did get some encouragement uh, along the way. For a, after I made the decision to go, I decided where I thought I would be best placed was was to help smaller agencies, medium-sized agencies, find their their next uh, expression of, of progress and value. You and I, we knew each other a little bit before then, but we were able to work together. And you were very supportive, um, a huge source of inspiration and, and encouragement uh, for, for me. There, there were a few others, both in the agency world and outside the agency world, that, that kind of took a similar interest, and, and I had a great time uh, collaborating with them. Uh, and what I came through my experience with you and, and, and others was to realize that this little aquarium I was in was actually just a little container in a much bigger sea of, of opportunity as it relates to, to communications, PR, marketing, and, and, and media. 
that's not to disparage where I was from. I just was I was blinded to what was what was available outside of uh, of, of of that environment. Um, one of the agencies I was I was advising um, was in need of some structural help and some and looking for investment. And I brought them to a guy I had worked with, knew uh, and respected for a long time, uh, Bob Pearson, who started the Next Practices Group, which you referenced earlier. Uh, that transaction didn't work out in the end, but he was so gracious and generous in the way he managed that process. Uh, I thought he might be disappointed in in the outcome, maybe disappointed in me for not able for not being able to, to steer it to conclusion. Um, but instead, he said, "No, let's let's work together. We we need more of those opportunities, and that they don't always come home. They don't always come home on the first try. But uh, let's let's work together." And I and I saw that we we did have kind of a nice. Uh, complementary approach to, to business and a, and a shared view of, of, of what's next. So um, so earlier this year, I, I joined the Next Practices Group. But had I known, um, well, I didn't know that that was going to be the outcome when I when I left uh, Omnicom. I was I was quite nervous about that. So if you are nervous about it, I guess I just say um, gather some support, uh, talk to people you trust and, and respect, uh, and and take the leap of faith. I'd like to get on, if I may, to the book and revisiting that shortly, but you know the way that my brain works and we tend to just go wherever the flow of the conversation is. Something that intrigues me, and and I'm actually going to almost treat this as a as an open question to you both, because I'm intrigued, is that moment going back into your history, the lessons you learned about going to another territory and working within that territory, my experience is is something I'd like to share, which is um, having worked for an agency in London, uh, the goal was always to go international and international was always defined as opening a, a unit in New York. It just, It's the default. You're in London, you open in New York, you're in New York, you open in London or, you know, somewhere else in, in North America. So my question to you is, did you face that classic moment where you go, I know I'm good at what I do, but there are brilliant people here and I'm not bringing the font of everything. I have to actually think differently because I'm playing in their yard now. That's for me. I mean, uh, no one does this better than Farzana. I I mean, in terms of uh, recognizing where she needs to uh, help people feel comfortable with with how things are, are, are done in this part of the world or making how things are done in this part of the world understandable to other people in other parts of the world. No one's better than, than Prasanna. And I, I say that with, with firsthand knowledge, having sat through a number of client conversations with her. So she, she might be better uh, suited. But, but since I'm talking now, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll continue to answer. My, my first two years at least were extremely humbling um, on, on just about every level. What I thought I knew professionally, and I'd like to think was valid, but uh, it, it was a lot less meaningful in a place where the media works differently, where government organizations function differently, where stakeholder relations are defined differently. Uh, all that was a huge um, wake up for me. And as I said, I came in a little bit arrogantly thinking that I had what it, I had the knowledge that would, that would make me successful. But it was also humbling uh, personally uh, as well. My, my interpersonal skills, which I had kind of honed against, um, you know, an American backdrop, <laughs> um, didn't always register with, with, with people uh, here. It took me a long time to understand just basic exchanges and how uh, progress is actually made in, in, in relationships and, and conversations. So I would say, yeah, it was at least two years of not quite utter humiliation but but it was a humbling it was a humbling experience and it took me a while to, to kind of regain my, uh, my my confidence and realize that I still had something to offer but it was just going to be on other people's terms not necessarily how I thought I was going to succeed yeah I think it's it's, it's fascinating because um, I switched from accounting to politics to PR and I've always been interested in the other. I've always been, you know, very sort of curious and uh, and happy to sort of do learning curves in, in different sectors. And I, I find it sort of, you know, curiosity is really key. So when you go into a new environment or a new culture, to just be curious, to learn, having that humility uh, as well, because you have to sort of, in a way, put down your sack of tools and and expertise that worked in a previous culture or, you know, a previous sector, you just have to 
be humble. Um, and I think the third piece is listen. So really actively listening. Um, because, you know, when you're in an environment where you've been doing really well, you can sometimes start treading water and actually stop listening. Um, and I think when you put yourself out of that comfort zone into a new arena, um, then I think the sort of active listening skill uh, set really helps. Um, but yeah, really interesting um, and really inspiring, David, how you have um, you know, pivoted from uh, different parts of, of the industry. I really appreciate hearing that from both of you, because my experience was your accent can only get you so far for so long. You're the one that's interesting because you're the person who's different in the room and people will for a while ask you, well, what's it like back home? How is the industry in from your experience? And, you know, there might be brands that work in one territory and another, but the relationship dynamics can be incredibly different. And Farzana, particularly when I see you working uh, across the globe and touching many organizations and representing many and giving them a voice or helping provide them with a voice i i certainly see that um that sense of localization for different corporations is incredibly important and powerful because the voice that organization x needs in north america is one thing but the voice they need in the united kingdom or even in different parts of europe is something then that is different now um david if we could go back a couple of years a few years now because we kind of started this journey in 2020 um pandemic was was uh, really uh, on top of us it was a desperately strange and sad situation and the world was a was a different place we've come out to a to a world which has evolved and we have different ways of communicating we have different ways that people engage with each other in meaningful ways and throughout all this period of time obviously the book the reason why we connected um in the first place i'd like to just revisit for people who haven't um really touched upon it could you just give us the high level reason behind it and your collaboration and then the lessons you've learned since and is there anything that you would do differently Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely things I would do differently. Um, and I, I, I have thought about this recently and not just in anticipation of this conversation, but, but partly. So the, the, the book came out two years ago and it probably took me almost that entire two years before I wanted to actually read it <laughs> again. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever written something like that, but you, you get pretty sick of it. And, and the last thing you want to see is a typo or a mistake or just something you wish you'd rephrase. So it took me a while to, uh, to, to pick it up. But just to go back, I, I, I co-wrote it with uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Omnicom colleague, John O'Brien, um, who's written several books on, on purpose, um, had good relationships with publishers, and was extraordinarily generous with both his knowledge and, and contacts. And I don't know, in fact, I'm pretty sure I would not have, have done it, not done it yet, without his his help and, and guidance. So he was the, the senior writer on, on the book. Um, we approached a publisher here in London in, in a meeting without a proposal and walked out with the contract. So this is how this is how clear he was in his vision and the types of relationships he had. And I always remember that was in January of 2020. Um, so he went back to Shropshire where he lives. I, the meeting was in London. I just got on the tube and went home. And I never saw him again until after the book was published because everything got got locked down. So we wrote the entire book like this virtually. Uh, which was not ideal. And there was definitely moments when I, I I didn't sleep. I was worried about making deadlines. I was worried if this even made sense. Um, sometimes he had to encourage me not to give up. Sometimes I had to encourage him uh, not to give up. But um, but we but we made it through. And I've reread the book, and I'm pretty I'm pretty happy with it still. Um, he might be. I hope he's happy with it still. But it's, I'm speaking for for myself on it. I'll speak just a little bit about the book, and then I'll speak about books in, in general, and, and hopefully offer some encouragement to you too, in particular, but to, to listeners. Um, looking back on it, what we had what we had foreseen was a world changing quite quickly. Uh, we we did manage to make some references to to the pandemic, although we didn't really know what we were in when we were we were writing it. Um, but what we saw a culture, a society, uh, an environment that we described as as VUCA, you know, volatile, uncertain, complex, and, and ambiguous. And um, and we thought that was going to put business leaders and communicators in a particularly 
challenging position and that they were going to have to make sense of what people expected of them, what their stakeholders, customers, consumers, investors, what was expected of them, but in an environment that was changing quite quickly. And we, and we tried to kind of map out what had happened in the past 200 years of business and where we thought things might go. Um, and I'm happy to say, I think we got most of it right. I, I think that things have gotten more VUCA uh, than less. I don't think that's changing. Um, and I think if we didn't say how to deal with it, we at least gave people ample warning that as a brand, as a company, as a leader, as an institution, um, expectations will shift, um, but they'll never avert themselves. They'll never go away. You're always going to be asked to uh, have a point of view on, on, on matters. So I think we got that right. Just where I think we got it wrong. Um, I wish we'd spent more time on ESG. I think I, will, I did look. I think there's only like two chapter, two pages on ESG. Um, and it, in our defense, we both looked at it as kind of an acronym that makes sense for uh, investment analyst. And that's how we looked at it. We didn't really look at it as a, as a political football. We didn't look at it as any sort of social commentary. It's more just a benchmark to see if, if companies were well well managed. I wish we'd spend a little bit more time on that. I also think we, we combine the idea of brand purpose and organizational purpose um, and, and should have either spent more time delineating. They are very similar, but they're quite different too. delineating the differences or maybe even it should have been, uh, you know, two different books because they are they are quite different concepts. And I've had to in different conversations kind of explain what we meant or why we thought the concepts uh, applied. But the main, that, that's, that's just my experience. And I, I, I got a lot out of the process. I try to write. One thing I've tried to maintain is a habit of writing something every day. Um, I don't always put that out or you know, I don't always post it, although that was helpful too. The feedback and the reactions you get really helps your your writing. Um, but the main thing, and I say this really to you both, because Dan, you, you've spoken to hundreds of, of leaders and in, in comms and PR. And I know you've got some great stories and uh, anecdotes to share. Um, I know definitely, Farzana, you've got at least three books in, in you. Um, and I would just say, I would really encourage you. I want to hear them. I think other people do. But you personally will benefit from the process of writing down your your thoughts, forcing yourself to put them into some sort of table of contents, and then and then working through some, some copy. Whether you ever decide to get it published or not, you'll benefit from it. It will it will consolidate your your thinking and i bet when you get some feedback you realize that you do have something publishable and i think that's true with with most people uh at least a lot of your your listeners have things worth worth saying and there's there's will be no harm in actually starting the the process so bring us all the way back to john uh, o'brien i'm very grateful for him asking me to do this with him because i i don't know if he hadn't said words similar to me uh, i don't know that i would have done it on my own so get out there and write your books. Farzan, what's your thoughts on that? <laughs> We've talked about this, Farzan. Yeah, I, I, I've been wanting to write a book um, for literally 10 years. Um, and I just lack the discipline. And I've got this mind book. And in my mind, I sort of think, oh, you know, I've got this romantic notion of writing a book that I should hire out a little cottage on a lake somewhere and no internet and just sit there with my dog and, and, and you know, and this great inspiration will strike me and it will just flow um and I just uh and what I need to really do is is have the discipline like you David just every day you know get into the habit of writing finding a pocket in your in your sort of calendar you know I say to myself I don't have the time but the reality is if I've got the time to binge watch Netflix for like two hours uh you know or whatever or three hours um then I've got the time to write so it's really about being self-disciplined prioritizing and um and just you know and I think there's also a sense of fear you know there's a fear if I if I write it who the hell would want to read it um you know will it do well would anybody buy it other than my you know grandmother um so you know so, so i think there's a lot of fear and procrastination um at some point i would love to do it um let's just you know see but dan i mean you've interviewed so many uh, greats and giants of our industry like david so i guess for you just having that sort of condensed into you know all the different voices that you've listened to over the years i, I guess that's a really good way to go if I was ever to write a book, I think it would be called Lessons I've Learned. Um, the purpose of every podcast and where this started and the evolution of it was was to get access to people 
and just to ask questions because Fazan, you mentioned it, that, that essence of being curious, being willing to listen. And, you know, without this podcast, I would, you know, I would have probably picked up people's books or I would, you know, a- attend more events. I'm incredibly privileged in the fact that I've got a, I've got a mechanic, I've got a device to enable me to just speak to people and that for that i'm i'm very aware of and very um thankful for the one of one of the other things i'm really thankful for as well is well you know i've got a little device here and on this device i've got whatsapp and in whatsapp i find it very handy i can call people anywhere in the world and have chats and whatever but david your whatsapp group is possibly the anchor of nearly all free thinking in marketing, communications, public relations, and then humanity. There's a big sense of humanity. I love that people throw ideas out there and go, hey, thinking of this, any thoughts, or people who um, put kickoff topics on there. Can we go back to the start? I'm I'm intrigued. Why would you would use that as a platform? What inspired it? And has it become what you imagined, imagined it to become? Well, that's, that's, a, that's, an, yeah, that's a funny story. And it's, uh, it kind of goes back to my, my bumbling Forrest Gump approach to, uh, to life. I did not design that with any, in, any purpose or intent. It was, it was more just uh, an experiment. Before I go into that, I just want to say, you do make a really good point. You, you, you're, you're writing and creating every single day by virtue of what you do. And I, I really wouldn't want to diminish this, this podcast or your other, other projects. But I still would say you've got some wisdom you can condense and, and going through the process of writing it down would, would be helpful. Are you really trying to make me blush? Because it's working. <laughs> Anyone who's not watching this will see this bright red glow. David, you're being too kind. Now stop it. I just want to say that, that you, you should write down. My my chairman, Bob Pearson, I mentioned, he's he just took a similar approach to what you did. He realized that over the years, he's talked to hundreds of leaders. So he's written a book called Firm Beliefs. It just takes down lessons that he's learned from other people. Again, very generous with what other people have taught him. And it's also a much easier way to write a book. No, not to disparage Bob's efforts, but when you're writing down in, in kind of anecdote form, it's a, it's, a, it's an easy way to get it, get a lot of wisdom out there. But back to the, to the WhatsApp group. So I, I knew that I did not have the discipline. This is when I was uh, uh, running my own advisory business. I didn't have my own, I didn't have the discipline to write a blog. Uh, and I also felt... Other people's blogs were really interesting. I couldn't imagine that mine would be interesting at, at all. Um, but I thought I'd probably have one thing I could discover a day that would be worth sharing. So that's literally what, what I did. I invited 10 or 15, Farzana, you were definitely in the original set, people that I thought if I didn't have something interesting on a day, they certainly would. And I started posting a link or something that I thought was interesting. Um, uh, usually related to PR or, or marketing or, or media, occasionally dipping into politics and then often dipping into science or culture, but but usually how these things were communicated, how they were treated uh, by journalists or uh, or businesses or or, or brands, um, and that group's got about a little over four hundred members um, right now, and they're from all over the world, um, all different levels. About half, I don't actually know. They, they just identify as a phone number because I, uh, they, they kind of found their own way in. So I don't always know who they are. It's required almost no policing, though. I mean, it's a very self-regulated group. And what I think it speaks to, to your, your kind of setup for this, Dan, is, is the power of community. And um, without trying to get too profound about it, what I realize is that um, there are, it's so easy now to create uh, and participate in communities of all kinds um, that don't take a lot of work. Uh, and in fact, you don't have to be the star of them at all, but you'll find daily sources of, of inspiration, of perspectives, you, you know, Q&A. Uh, what I love about this group is people will just, without hesitation, say, does anybody know how to blank? And And they'll usually get four or five really good answers uh, about that, or how you need to worry about doing it differently in India than you might in, in South Africa. So um, it's a very powerful way of uh, uh, creating, I think, a, a responsive, uh, encouraging community. I've, said, I've done the same thing for my university alumni uh, group, different set of interests. 
Uh, I'm in a, a group that I didn't organize, but I tried to be active in for businesses interested in encouraging other businesses to get out of out of Russia related to supporting the people of, of Ukraine. Um, actually, an initiative that Farzana brought me into very early in the war with some of her contacts. So um, there are some kind of concentric overlapping circles and some of the things. But main point here is that if if you don't, if you can't find a community that works for you, then you can create one quite easily. But I'm pretty sure that uh, you'll be able to find one pretty quickly. And then I would just say, dive in. Can I just say, I love your WhatsApp group. It's the only WhatsApp group that I am a willing participant of. All of the other WhatsApp groups is because I'm forced to be um, to be in there. Um, but I love it because, you know, I love reading the news. And then I go on the WhatsApp group because whatever news is sort of trending, someone's you know found an interesting story. And then you have these incredibly smart PRs that are giving their different perspectives. Um, so it's so fascinating. Um, and I and it's part of my daily routine. And it's added so much value. And I just think it's incredible that we have these tools today, like WhatsApp. And David, you just decided to create a WhatsApp group that adds so much value to so many of us. Um, and I think it's just having that sense of community because you have certain voices in the group that comment quite often. And um, and they're always incredibly insightful um, and really take sort of care, not to sort of just do a knee-jerk reaction comment, but really well thought up because, of course, you know, who wants to sort of say the wrong thing in front of hundreds of PR people, <laughs> you know, who are going to sort of with a, with a critical gaze, uh, you know, sort of dissect everything. So it's actually, it, it's, it's such a brilliant platform and, I, and huge gratitude. Uh, to you, David. If somebody's listening and they want to be part of this WhatsApp group, what would you advise them to do? Uh, well, I, I usually don't publish the link uh, uh, openly just because it. I'll, I'll get we'll get inundated with with crypto bots and porn bots and all sorts of unsolicited uh, uh, <laughs> input. Um, uh, it probably just to DM me and I can share uh, a link. Uh, and I will occasionally post it like on my LinkedIn. Uh, profiles. That might be the easiest way. People find me on LinkedIn, and I can I can deliver it uh, that Absolutely. way. Yeah, but you're right. You know, there it, there is kind of a general, like a sociologically uh, uh, consistent eighty twenty rule, and I, I think twenty percent of the participants post about eighty percent of the content. And I bet that's true in just about any other environment when you, when you get people together. I think sometimes that can be intimidating for others who are kind of afraid about making their debut post. So if you are in that group, that, that 80% and you're worried is now my moment to post, it, it definitely is. And I, I would just encourage people to go ahead and, and say what they uh, what, 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 what they want to say. It's not all PR people. I would say that too. I'd say it's about half PR people, um, half people just in other, usually Marcoms related disciplines. Um, there are probably a dozen journalists, and I have asked the journalists privately to treat the content carefully. I, I didn't want this to be a source of big scoops and, and to you know go back to people. And, and that people were, were expressing themselves pretty free, freely and I didn't want anybody to worry about that. Um, and they're probably about 25, I would say to 40, pretty senior clients. And it's just interesting to see, I, I can see kind of who's, who's interested in what kinds of content. And they're very interested in certain types of content. They're reluctant sometimes to identify themselves so that, you know, for understandable reasons, they don't want to get swarmed by by agency people. But um, but it's a good, healthy mix. So I hope as it as it grows, we'll kind of keep the same proportions. I think it's great. And what's incredible um, is that you do so much. You create these communities and WhatsApp. It's the first I've heard that you have more than one. Um, you have one for your alumni um, as well as you know for for business owners. Uh, you also obviously have. You know, created and published this incredible book on purpose, uh, which so many of us have have read, and it's really shifted our thinking in terms of how we work. Uh, you've also cre created, so was it the Ukraine Communications Network as well? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. At the beginning of the war, that that was a PRCA in, initiative, and, and full credit to PRCA and to ICCO uh, for trying to create a platform for agencies and and consultants who were eager to do something for the people of Ukraine um, and, and needed a, a platform for doing that. So uh, so I, I co-chaired co that sorry, with uh, Natalia Popovich, um, very respected leader, business leader from Ukraine. Um, and it's I don't want to say it's run its course because the war hasn't run its course, but um, we did find over time it was hard to maintain that, that kind of same level of, of intense commitment 
from agency people. So she is active in this organization called, uh, became active in, in another organization called Business for Ukraine. And that's a coalition of different civil society organizations, some businesses, uh, and, and some government organizations, some universities to encourage Western businesses to uh, exit the, the Russian and, and, and Belarusian uh, markets, just because that their, their tax revenue ends up fueling the, the war effort. Uh, and I've joined as, as a volunteer advisor for that. So that's where most of my, my time goes um, as it relates to Ukraine. But I will, and I, I have to thank you, Farzana, because when the war first broke out, you were very well connected with uh, the Ukrainian uh, diaspora. And, and you introduced me to a number of people that I'm still in, in contact with and, and made that issue um, a personal one uh, for me. And I, I you know, I, I think I would have, like a lot of people, been appalled by what I was seeing, but not sure how or where or whether to get involved. Um, and really, you helped open the doors for, for that. So you know how to do this, too. <laughs> but you really walked the talk. I mean, all of your ideas and values in your book on purpose, you really have taken that and and launched so many initiatives, be it creating a community for PRs uh, to, you know, to supporting businesses who want to support Ukraine, um, as, you know, as well as so many others. Um, what I was intrigued as an you know, agency co-founder, you know, often, you know, we set up agencies and we just work, 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 sort of hamster on a hamster, you know, hamster wheel, constantly running, um, you know, just focusing on keeping the client suite and the colleague suite. And it's just that dynamic. And eventually, after a while, we're like, ah, what do we do now? Um, do we want to continue running the business? Is it sellable? What do we need to do now in order for it to be sellable? Do you know you sometimes see these sort of big acquisitions and PR week and so and so has been bought by X million and so and so has been bought and then there's so many other agencies that you never hear about anything and do they wind down and you've got the management buyout option which you know I think Lanson's recently went went down that route. Um, so I just wanted to know for agency sort of co-founders who are either immediately thinking of selling or thinking in the next 10 years, what advice would you give them? Um, because, you know, we often think, well, it's a people's business. It's so relationship orientated. How could you sell that? Um, you know, so just wanted to hear in terms of, you know, with your new role, what do you look for? What do you advise? What are the timelines? Um, I think that would be incredibly useful. Yeah, no, I'm happy to. And thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, so I've, I've been in this this new role f since February, I guess, and I bet I've spoken to uh, sixty, maybe seventy founders. Not not all in PR businesses. We're 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 trying to build a group that that has solid future looking businesses across different disciplines, and, and PR is just one of them. But um, but just because my own background experience, I've been talking mostly to uh, to PR people. And their concerns or excuses for not thinking about this are exactly as you just outlined it. You know, I got too busy. Uh, I got clients who need me right now. I've got people who are counting on me. Uh, I don't even know if I have something sellable. So those are those are exactly the the, the barriers. And I guess what I'd say is I, I understand that completely. But if you do want some value in the business you're building now, you have to start thinking about this now. It, it won't. It, an exit probably won't just fall in your, your lap. Um, so that, I guess that's the bad news. If you consider that bad, bad news, you're, you're going to have to be proactive with this. The good news is that right now the market, uh, here in the UK where, where you and I are sitting, uh, but I think it's probably true, Dan in Canada, in the U S a lot of international or Western European markets, the market's pretty good for what we're doing. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Partly going back to the way we started off this conversation about just how chaotic the world is now and how, Organizations need help, and they need help from quality businesses and consultancies that know how to help them navigate that. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, what we do is, is valuable right now. So that's good news. The second piece of good news is that there are a lot of different roads you can you can take. You if you want to get out quick and and make your your, your money, um, there are there are buyers for that. That's going to require certain. Uh, organization and structure for your, your business. And, and, and you, you probably need to, to test the market quickly to see if you've got something that will help you that way. If you're looking further along for a business that you think can grow, um, that's where we fit in. We help with the different kind of investment, different type of structures to help you grow a business that will be worth hopefully more later than it would have been by itself. So we build that together. 
um, there are ways to make it valuable for your employees through, uh, through a management buyout, as, as you talked about. Um, there's no shortage of, of ways forward. Um, I guess what I'd say is if, if you're thinking about it, then, then start a conversation, realizing there are multiple ways of, of doing this. Um, and, and then just, um, you know, keep, keep at it, but it won't happen. It won't happen by itself. You're, you're going to have to, to be proactive, not you personally, but agency. If someone is interested or, you know, be it immediate or sort of, you know, sort of 10 years, um, are you open for them to reach out to you to have a conversation? Oh, definitely, yeah. About next practices and how does next practice work? So for instance, you know, do you just acquire an agency outright? Is it over time? Is there an earn out period? What's sort of, what's sort of unique about the positioning of your organization amongst the whole landscape of, you know, M&A specialists and, and so forth out there so people kind of understand? Yeah, well, we try to be, but you know, I'll be honest, everybody's going to say this, but we try to be founder friendly. Um, and, and just like this conversation we've just been having, I think we have a pretty good idea what founders are thinking about and the concerns they will have, not just for the deal itself, but for the people that they've hired, the clients that they've worked to cultivate. So we, we do work hard to create something that creates value uh, over time. We, we don't do earnouts. Um, so for people who want a quick lucrative exit um there are other options for them and and you know i i was at omnicom for a number of years and and you know worked through a bunch of those and, and hopefully some of them <laughs> were successful so i don't want to disparage uh those but but if you are looking over a five to ten year horizon and you see uh opportunities that would requ- that that you could realize with a little bit of help and that could be financial that could be strategic that could be networking maybe some combination of the three i think we're uh we're we're a good fit uh, for, for, for those. So, um, usually yeah, the conversations divide, uh, pretty quickly and you know, people say, I just, I just want to make as much money as I can right now for what I built. Fair enough. And like I say, they're great options for you to, to do that. If you say, actually, I'm on a longer horizon. Can we talk about what the future might look like? That's, that's more our approach. There's, there's a question to this structure and just listening to you both speaking about this. There are people who come into the industry who are practitioners and they will forever be practitioners and don't really want to own or run a business and that's not on their trajectory. There are others that come into this industry. They either work for someone else or they start at that embryonic stage of solo or partnership, etc. And there's a goal to grow a great business. But is there something? Is there something about the structure of this business, this um, this trade that we're in, that really does seem to encourage this, you know, I wouldn't like to call it a selling mentality to cash out. But I look at a lot of different sectors, and I don't necessarily see it with all of them, that there is this desire to become, become taken over by a holding group. But with with our sector, there is. Do you think there's some reason behind that or or some motivation or it's just the natural way that many organizations have gone? Well, I, I would actually be curious to see how Farzana uh, answers this. But um, I mean, you you left the accounting world. I, I don't know if that followed the same sort of trajectory. I know that sometimes small accountancies sell themselves to bigger accountancies. But um, so maybe there's a parallel industry, but but you also saw something in, in comms and PR that was attractive to you. So um, I'd, I'd be more interested in your perspective than, than mine, although I'm not trying to dodge your questions. So I will come back to <laughs> I think it's really interesting because obviously I've uh, I've worked in accounting and also in PR and they are both professions, you know, they're, they're service businesses. And I do a lot of work with law firms. So I've got quite a lot of insight working with law firms. And I always find it fascinating how you know, and, and also sort of management consultants. So how do we sort of organize our sort of knowledge and how do we sell our knowledge? Um, and how do we sort of embed it into a brand that is sellable beyond the founders? Um, and, you know, and, and often I sort of find, obviously with lawyers, you have the partnership model. Um, you've seen some PR agencies sort of flirt with a with a partnership model um, and, you know, more on the sort of, you know, the corporate comm side. Um, you've got, you know, some agencies that really build brands. So when you think about McKinsey, you don't really think about, you know, the sort of senior leadership as such, you know, the brand has done so well in terms of, uh, you know, that people buy McKinsey, like they buy sort of IBM. Um, so I think when I look at sort of PR agencies, I sort of, 
you know, I've got people, friends in advertising agencies who just always seem a little bit more bolder in the way they approach their business. And I think it's because advertising agencies in the past had access to data that made them sort of, you know, less apprehensive about selling their wares. And I think with PRs, if we look at our history, uh, you know, a lot of the work that we were doing or when I first started out was media relations where we didn't have much control over the output. So we were selling services always slightly on a back foot because we couldn't 100% quantify um, and qualify the work that we were doing. And I think that gave us an inherent instability, inherent sort of um, insecurity, which other professional service firms don't. I mean, you know, we're always sort of like, so sort of, oh, sorry, you know, the media coverage didn't go your way. It must be our fault. We'll work for free for another month. You know, um, I just won't eat for another, you know, two weeks. Um, whereas, you know, you're not going to get a law firm saying, well, sorry, you lost the case, honey. Um, let me just give you a refund on the law for legal fee. So, you know, there's something about the psyche of the PR. Innately, we are people pleasers, um, you know, some of us. And so, and I think, you know, there's a mixture of our, you know, like like um, our background as, as being, uh, feeling inferior to our sort of marketing brothers and sisters um, and ad agencies um, and that sort of sense of people pleasing and not having confidence in ourselves. And I think as we move from tactical to strategic work, um, you know, and I think the more bold we are, the more confident we are, then we can actually really kind of sort of demarcate our lanes. Because at the moment, everyone's swimming in each other's lanes. We've got law firms coming into public affairs. We've got, you know, accountancy firms you know, working on sort of reputation. Um, and so, and management consultants, you know, are there to take, you know, to take our, our strategic work unless we really start building confidence in an industry. I mean, we're still thinking, how do we, you know, what is PR? and you know and where does it start and where does it end um so we're having all that sort of existential angst uh that we need to overcome um but i'm really gung-ho about the pr industry i think that um i think we are at the right place at the right time uh, we've got now this data and we've got the ability to communicate not just with the gatekeepers of journalists but we can communicate directly and that comes great power but also great sense of responsibility and that's where i think david your book is so important because purpose wasn't that needed in the PR industry back in the day when the journalists were the gatekeepers because they were the ethical lens we would just pitch and we would just say well it's not our responsibility because the journalist makes the ultimate decision but we are now creating content that goes straight into the heart of the public and that's why purpose is critical in PR and that's why I think you know we are at the forefront of this sort of you know new era of public relations which I think is really exciting but I hope we can have the confidence to um to stand up you know uh, you know, on our own two feet and, and not be as humble as we are, perhaps. I knew you'd have a good answer, a better answer than, than mine. So I'm, I'm glad you, 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 you went with that. So, uh, <laughs> so thanks for that. Did I, did I get what you wanted to get to as well, Dan? Yeah, I, um, I think that there's an interesting space where we haven't necessarily seen the value in ourselves and we've heard how great, it, how green the grass is over here or over at the other side and that that sense of self-belief i've got someone who comes into my office every day and and gives it gives this affirmation of you've got this and do you know how many times i now say i know do you know what <laughs> i'm not being arrogant i know what to do it's just the getting there sometimes is the challenge but just hearing it makes such a difference. And so, for some people, it's looking at the wall and seeing the certificate from the university. And for other people, it's the book or books. And for, for me, Bella coming into my office and saying, you got this, it makes such a difference. Um, David, just, just moving on, if we can, as we're getting towards the end of our time together, that next generation that does come into public relations and this crazy Marcom's world. The years that you had at Omnicom, the experience you've got now, the experience in your early part of your career, would you say that the advice that Farzana, yourself and, and me, that I could give to people is relevant to someone who is 18 years old? Or are we more to get to that stage of nurturing? Because the world has changed. The principles of communication and relationship building has not changed. But should we dare to still speak to the youth and the future of tomorrow? Well, I, I 
Yes, I, I think we should, and that's uh, I spend some you know available time. I try at least once a week to do something where I'm either talking to a class or a student or writing something that I think would would entice smart people into our our business. But this this thing that Farzana was talking about in terms of our our confidence, where we fit in in the world, what our real value is, uh, it's ongoing. And I've been in this business for a really long time now, and and we keep having the same conversations, which leads me to believe that there might not ever be a resolution to it. It's just it's just a, a condition that we exist in. I think you could do a whole spinoff series of podcasts on uh, on giving people, you know, weekly positive affirmations of value within the in the PR community. But uh, I'll, I'll let you you decide your, your hold on. Wait, I'll see if Bella will come in. No. OK. <laughs> But yeah, I, I uh, one, I do think that like like all businesses, trades, professions, whatever we call ourselves, you know, we're we're in a battle for the the best and brightest of of, um, of the next generation. So I, I think we, if we believe in what we're doing, we think it has a future. Then then we have to stay committed to to, to encouraging people, uh, bright people, to come into this business and keeping bright people from from exiting, from from seeing you know some some other reason to to leave, and and that can be a full time job uh, by itself. Does our advice have any value? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I, I don't always get an opportunity to go back and ask people what they what they've done. Um, but I've seen a few people that I met earlier in their careers who got on to succeed, not because of me. Um, I hasten to say, but um, but it gives me some some encouragement. Um, I, I I won't name them because I, I don't have permission to. But I, I met with a at the time a young student from Poland. Uh, studying here in, in London, and he asked to interview me for a series of uh, of interviews uh, he was posting on on LinkedIn, which, by the way, was a brilliant idea on his part. So he would he you know emails me or texts me on LinkedIn and said, by the way, so and so, an agency, you know your your counterpart competitor at another agency, uh, he answered my five questions about what it takes to get ahead in PR. Would you do the same thing? And of course, yeah, of course, I'll do that. I, I'm as important as that guy. Um, so then I answered my five questions, um, and he said, but, and can I, can you recommend somebody else that would do this? I probably even asked him to go talk to you for some. So anyway, he ends up publishing, you know, 200 of these little micro interviews with very bright, well, not always, but, you know, mostly bright people, um, in, in, in the business, senior people, he, pretty sure he got one or two job offers out of it. And that in itself embodies what I try to tell students or young people to do. So. Go out and make connections. Um, ask people questions that you think their answers will be useful, and then be generous with what they they've told you. So rather than use this advice and try to hoard it for your own professional development, go out and, and share it. Create a community around that. Have share that with your your you know fellow students and and eventually your 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 colleagues. And, and for me, it's kind of a just a little microcosm of community of content of humility, but also uh, generosity. And, and I use that example a lot. Um, but if that's too complex or too abstract, I, I, I've started quoting Barack Obama on this when, when, uh, when students ask him for advice and he says, just be the person who knows how to get shit done. And if you are the person who can get shit done, it doesn't matter what level you are, what field you're in, what you're doing, you will be the person that becomes most valuable, uh, you know, to your, uh, to, to, to your team. And I, I firmly believe that. So, they're not mutually exclusive. You can do them both, but um, that's what I, that, that's kind of how I, the advice I try to give. So uh, I guess my last question is, um, you know, to thrive in PR, there's constantly new platforms and channels and, you know, and the world is constantly moving and we've got new AI driven tools. Um, so you so let's just park all of that there in terms of all the stuff that we need to continuously learn and unlearn and, and learn. And that's a given that change will be a constant in terms of the tools that we get to play with. Um, but in terms of attitude, what type of you know attitude or approach to life you know, should a PR have? I mean, you mentioned, for instance, you know, creating content and community. And when I look at your career and I look at, you know, how you've succeeded, a lot of what you do is you've got a very generous heart. It's all about giving. It's like, 
what value can I bring to people without any sort of expectation of anything in return? And that builds a lot of, I think, goodwill in the industry, which is why everyone always champions you and always is very positive whenever your name is is mentioned. Um, and so I'd say one area that just observing you over the years is that sort of generosity of spirit. Um, what else do you think that a you know a PR should really sort of possess and 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 you know and and hone um and ignore the technical side of you know PR obviously it's just more character well first of all, that's very kind of you so thank you um everything you said uh is touching so thank you for for, for that um I'm, I'm not um a fan of generosity just because I'm a nice guy I actually practically pragmatically think it it, it works well in the long run and that uh whatever you give you get back three or four or five fold so uh in some ways it's almost a selfish act but um i just think things work better when you when you behave in that way um i guess i would kind of come back to things that i've learned from you in particular farsana just because i've seen you in settings that i haven't always seen dan in but but um you are extraordinarily extraordinarily good listener and um I've been in situations where I wasn't sure where the conversation was going to go or if between the two of us, we had anything of value <laughs> to offer, maybe selling you short and maybe admitting my own insecurities. But um, but in your listening and ability to kind of keep people talking, you were able to uncover what the real concern was or opportunity uh, was. And that is an art that a lot of people don't have naturally. I do think it's learnable. I, I think you're, you, I don't know if you, if you have always been a good listener, maybe, maybe somebody taught you how to do this, but, um, but, but you are. And, um, and I think that's kind of the second thing I look for when I'm talking to potential colleagues or investments or, uh, or people to hire. First, I do want to sense their, uh, generosity, but right up there, I want to know, are they a good listener? Um, almost more importantly to me than are they a good speaker or writer? Or, or anything else, because if, if if you're not a good listener, I don't think you're going to be a good speaker or, or writer or or even a thinker. Um, and I guess a and maybe this is a restatement of one or both of them. But uh, the third thing I look for is is a sense of uh, of kindness. Um, um, in different stages of my career, I realize I've been in environments that were not really concerned with kindness. And maybe that's too soft. We weren't too concerned with humanity. <laughs> you know, they were they were much more focused on on other harder uh, metrics. And that's fine. There's plenty of people who can thrive in that environment, but that's that's just not one that I found conducive for for myself. So, generosity, listening, kindness slash humanity. I think that's a pretty good recipe for at least the kind of PR that I want to be involved with that I want to practice. We've come to the end of another episode. David, I was just looking at the archive here. You're the only person to have appeared on Fuse three times, and I look forward to the fourth appearance very, very much so. Um, if people wanted to find out more and get in touch, you've heard me ask this question before. How could they do that, David? Uh, LinkedIn is easy. Uh, I'm most of, well, on Instagram and Twitter. I am, it's a longer story, but T-Bone Gallagher. Uh, pretty easy to find uh, or by email david.gallagher at nextpracticegroup.com and Farzana we obviously want people to uh, be able to connect with you how can they do that? God I'm everywhere um, I love all social media platforms Instagram Twitter LinkedIn uh, threads but kind of slightly got bored of that now um, but I, I check everything you know every day so um, yeah whatever is easiest for people and you can find me, I'm Dan Gold Media. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Fuse. If you'd like to find out more about this very production, it's incredibly simple. Go to prca.org.uk forward slash Fuse. You'll find all of the links to all of our episodes. But I am going to ask you if you can pop on to your favourite podcast app. If it has the opportunity for you to rate this, please do give it five stars or even better if that platform can allow you to do so.